This is Israeli Technology Founders Speak, a podcast of conversations with successful Israeli high-tech and biotech entrepreneurs, with your host, Avraham Hermon. Jeff Gabay is the chief scientist and president and founder of Argaman Technologies in Jerusalem, Israel, a company that engineers and produces cutting-edge fiber and textile technologies that are used in a wide range of industries from medical to military, cosmetics, and home goods. Avraham sat down with Jeff in the offices of Argaman Technologies to discuss how he built a successful tech company, lessons Jeff has learned over the years, how the company comes up with successful ideas and markets their products, dealing with competition, why Israeli tech companies are so successful, tips on raising capital, and much more. This podcast is a creation of J.M.B. Davis Ben David, an intellectual property law firm serving clients around the world. You have great innovations. We keep them safe. It's not just enough to have a great startup idea. If you don't legally protect your innovations, products, and brand, anyone can claim them as their own. We help you keep your great innovations secure. Learn more by going to jmbdavis.com. That's J-M-B-D-A-V-I-S dot com. What problem does Argamon solve? We seek to solve a lot of problems. And since this is probably going to be listened to by, by a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm going to try to direct myself toward that. And that is this. We've got to look at the difference between an idea and the ability to take that idea to respond to a market need. So if we look at Argamon, we are a platform, which means that we have four primary platform technologies, which can be applied to a lot of different products. And let me give you an example. One major problem in the world are hospital-acquired infections. The number one cause of death in hospitals are infections and not the reason people have gone to the hospital, which if you think about it is a horrible waste of life. In fact, if we look at it, and that is if the patient were treated at home or did his convalescence at home, he'd more likely not get that infection, which means it's an even greater waste of life. So what we look at is trying to solve those kinds of problems. One of the things that we have done in that is we've developed, for example, a self-sterilizing textile. Now, it works for self-sterilization, which will bring down drastically hospital-acquired infections, which means a reduction in morbidity and mortality. But there are also other end uses for the same technology. For example, we have a mask. We have the only mask in the world that will deactivate a virus faster than the virus can pass through the mask. So by definition... If you wear our mask, you can't transmit the disease, nor can you get the disease. Or, for example, if we take that technology and put it into a towel, well, I'm going to tell you something funny, and that is I've been using the same towel six days a week. We don't take a shower on Shabbat. Six days a week. I've only washed it once in the last two years. Yes, it's true. And the reason is simply the only reason that I washed it is because my wife told me she was going to leave me if I didn't. But (laughs) leaving that aside, it's self-sterilizing. So if it doesn't get physically dirty, it never has an odor. And by the way, the towel is two years old. It's still as fresh and fluffy as the day I got it from the factory. Or for example, socks. Uh, if you are a hiker or a runner or just a person that wears socks, I mean, I personally, it's going to sound funny, but I change my socks only once every month or so. And the reason is they're self-sterilizing. Avraham, don't faint. <laughs> so, but seriously, these are our, our medical tech, uh, technologies, which have a variety of, of end uses. And that's something as an entrepreneur, you should be looking at. So what do we solve? We solve a lot of problems. And that's what you want. You would like to solve a primary problem if you can. But if you can solve more problems, that's just that much better. You've mentioned a lot of different ideas and inventions that you've had and, and uh, different directions where you could take your technology. I'm interested in where your inspiration comes from. A lot of the inspiration comes from uh, personal end use. Having a textile background and having studied chemistry, biochemistry, pathology, and infectious diseases, 
what we look at is what's relevant to me as a human being, because if it's relevant to me, it's going to be relevant to you and my next door neighbor. So uh, if we have issues with odors, if we have issues with skin irritation, if we have, I'll give you an example, a small problem. Most people are not aware of it, but are you aware of the fact that when an astronaut goes into space, his heartbeat and blood pressure drop by 30%? Wow. In addition, he also begins to experience immediately symptoms of muscle muscular atrophy and osteoporosis. So there's nothing you can do. We, we have to live in gravity. But so what we do is in order to retard that, the only way you can retard it is through a number of hours a day of high level aerobics. Now, what we want is we want the benefit of the aerobics, but we don't want the cardiac strain. Remember, he's not exactly in a, he's, you know, 200 miles above the atmosphere. And if he has a heart attack, this man's in a lot of trouble. And remember that when he comes back into the atmosphere, his heartbeat and his blood pressure will jump by 30 seconds within a matter of seconds. So these guys have got to be in really, really top shape. So what we've developed is a fabric that will actually lower their heartbeat during an exercise regimen. Now, that will translate here on Earth to mean that you can run faster or ride your bicycle faster at the same pace of heart, or you can, at your normal heartbeat, go 7 to 10% faster than you did previously. These are the types of things that, that impact all of us. So your company seems to be taking a lot of different directions, and... How do you know what to focus on? Which, which in the end of the day, which direction should your company take out of all the different possibilities of your technologies being developed? Oh, that's actually very easy. It's called low-hanging fruit. <laughs> go, after, go after where your commercial uh, ability can be fulfilled as quickly as possible, simply because every company in the world needs financing. So we need to generate capital. Now, in our particular case, we do generate capital. But uh, we foresee that uh, every dollar that we make will probably be put back into this company for the next few years, simply because we want to expand our base. Also take into consideration that you don't know where competition is going to arise. So once you're in this race of technology, don't stop. We are always, always, always looking to improve what we do. That's, that's part of the rule. You said reinvesting just about every dollar that you make. Is that going to be focused on manufacture, R&D, or a combination of them? A lot of it is actually, at this stage in the company, is scale-up to mass production. Now, let me point out this to everybody, and that is that when you read about an idea in the newspaper, and I read about ideas all the time, and somebody says, oh, look, somebody's coming out with another mask, and they're going to compete against you. My first thing is, I, as a personality, am never afraid of competition, ever, because I make sure that we've got the science. The second thing is you need to look at where are they in a the stage. Now, I can tell you personally, when I see that the idea is coming out of a laboratory in a university, then I know they're years away from actually developing a product that will show up in the market, if at all. And the reason I say that is right now, our company is concentrating on its scale up to mass production. And it's very simple. Anybody who's ever worked in a kitchen knows that cooking for two is not the same as cooking for 200. We're setting up now to cook for 2,000. And I have to tell you, everything changes. In fact, it's an entire R&D section of this company that works on scale-up. So you've got a principle. And by the way, there are some companies, and I've seen this, that fail on their ability to scale-up. What we look at, again, is how do we respond to market needs? And that's got to be where you go first. And you said you're not worried about competition. I'm a patent attorney, and my job is to look out for and focus on competition. What safeguards do you have in place to make sure that your technology stays apart from others and is not copied by others? When I say I'm not afraid of competition, uh, that's not really the truth. Okay, everybody's afraid of competition. But what we need to look at is we need to be able to look at it eyeball to eyeball. And that is, what do I have? What do they have? Now, remember that, that technology is a never-ending process. You always in technology seek to improve your product. I don't care if you're making toilet paper or if you're making antibiotics. You, if you're making toilet paper, then seek to make a softer toilet paper or seek to make a toilet paper that's more durable and cost less. If you're making antibiotics, you've got competition because there are 12 people out there making the same one. Well, you want yours to be sold because you want your patients to react better to it. 
or you want your costs to be lower. And those are the things that we spend our time on. Even a product that is out the door today, and we have products that are out the door, but there's no shame in coming out with the new and better product, okay? And we do it all the time. It's, look, Apple does it all the time. You're talking about improving your products and uh, making your good products better. How many ideas do you have to come up with before you get to one that's successful, that's one that's big, that works well? There's actually a shortcut to that answer. Everybody's got ideas, but what you need to look at is not what your idea is, but rather what does the market need? In other words, what you need to do is not identify your idea, but identify the need in the market that your idea will respond to. So it changes things around a little because ideas are all over the place. But what you need to look at is, does your idea respond to a true market need? And what is the size of that market? And how will I be different than other people that are out there? And the issue that you've got to do is you've got to be very careful. Don't fall in love with your technology. You've got to be able to look at it objectively. So therefore, if we come up with a situation, well, you know, a thousand ideas and 10 of them will work. That's not how we work here. We go after specific products. I'm I'm going to give you an example now of something that uh, Avram did not see on the floor, but you will see. How many of you like mosquitoes? Well, I don't think there are too many of us who like it. And there are textiles out there that will act as a mosquito repellent. However, none of them have ever been accepted into the marketplace because they all come with some kind of a, a problem. In many cases, for example, it uses organic compounds which will denature and stop working. Or maybe when you wash the garment, it'll come out. Well, that means that there's a market for the product, but nobody has come up with a solution to give you a textile which is permanently anti-mosquito and also, by the way, safe for you. And that's the kind of thing that we look to fill. And the market for that, there's a short-term and a long-term market. The short-term market is everybody I know who hates mosquitoes. The long-term market for it would be places, for example, like the World Health Organization in their fight in Africa. And by the way, this company doesn't always do everything for money, all right? If tomorrow, and I and you can hold me this to, to this, if tomorrow we finish this project, the World Health Organization comes to us and says, Jeff, we need this product in Africa. And we know that price is a factor. Well, this company is likely to walk away from its profits and say, let's do it. Not everything is always about money. That's impressive. It sounds like you have a vision that's even greater than the bottom line in that you're interested in putting out a product that's going to help people and not necessarily only looking at profit. Well, that, that's the motivation. The money will come. Everybody, you know, every entrepreneur thinks one day he's going to be a multimillionaire. And I hope everybody is. But what we need to look at is your motivation. Did you do this just to make money? Well, that's also, that's legitimate too. But I personally, I want to fulfill my life with more than just money. Money is no longer the issue. I mean, after all, how many pairs of pants can you wear at one time? Said like a true expert in fabrics, textiles. (laughs) We had mentioned your mask technology. What has COVID-19 done for your company? It's been very challenging for a lot of companies out there. How has it impacted Argaman? I want to make a comparison here. We all know the New York Marathon. So you watch when when it starts or used to start before COVID (laughs) days. And there you'd see a quarter of a million people running on the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan. And of course, all 250,000 of them, if you were to ask who's going to win, everybody would say it's going to be me. And the question is, I'm now watching from a tall building, 250,000 people coming across the bridge. Well, imagine 250,000 manufacturers of masks and each one says, he's got the best. Well, everybody says he's got the best. But the question is, how do you differentiate yourself from others? And that is, what do I want my mask to do that will make my mask better than the others? And the answer is not a cheaper price. The answer is, I need to produce a mask that will truly, truly protect you from getting sick. And in order to do that, there's a lot of technology involved in being able to destroy the virus so quickly that by the time it passes through the mask, it's deactivated. That's what we've done. Now, the problem that we have is everybody says that's what they've done. 
Uh, maybe there are others out there that have done it, but I haven't seen them. I know that we have done it. And here we come to a very frustrating point, And that is, we can't say that we do this on our product until we've passed the FDA. If you go to the FDA, guess what? All 250,000 people that I just mentioned to you, they're all been to the FDA. We fortunately, because of the level of our science and our medicine, have actually attracted the attention of the FDA. But at the end of the day, the FDA is about data and we have to supply that data and we've got to do their tests. And some of their tests can be sometimes, for example, in biocompatibility, those tests can be almost two months long. So this company is spending the money and spending the time and will do the tests. And when we do finish the tests, we will apply for the FDA. The FDA has told us that our mask will be a national priority and that they will review the file within one week, which is an unheard of situation. Wow. At the end of the day, we are hopeful, and I say hopeful because I can't speak on behalf of the FDA, that we will not only be able to make viral deactivation claims, but we also will be able to make disease prevention claims. Again, what are we looking for? We're looking for absolute values in benefiting everybody. Hopefully, pretty soon we'll be past this pandemic. Where do you see your company five years down the road? Well, first of all, I got a feeling that five years down the road, we're still going to be facing this. I'm just going to comment on this just as a somewhat of an expert in the field. I actually can say I am an expert in the field. What we're seeing is not something that the pathologists and the epidemiologists of the world didn't know. You know, if you, if you go to a geologist and ask him, will there be an earthquake here? That doesn't matter where you are in the world. The answer will be yes, but we just don't know when. Well, guess what? As it comes to pandemics, that was the exact same thing. Not only do we know that it would come, we even know the strain that would come. We just didn't know how it would come. This virus is going to continue, and it is likely that we're going to be faced at some point with a virus that crosses strains. So we've got to be prepared whether it happens or not. We've got to be prepared for worst case scenarios. What we are looking at are not mask technologies because the mask will be completed and ready. What we're going to look at are other ways of protecting people. For example, for example, we're working now with a government agency outside of Israel where the postal workers or anybody who receives the public is concerned about exposure to the virus. So we're actually making their uniforms be antiviral. What has the, you know, COVID done? Well, it actually did act as, as an accelerator for the company. It could be that maybe hospital acquired infections is only relevant to the medical community and the hospital community, and therefore it's not as much of a public issue. But what COVID did was it brought us to the front of the line. And whether we wanted to be there or not, we're there. We're all hoping and praying to get past this pandemic very quickly. You're located here in Jerusalem, capital of Israel. I want to ask you, how has being in Israel improved your business? A very interesting thing, especially for all you entrepreneurs out there. The technologies that we've developed in this country could actually never have been developed outside of Israel. Why is that? The reason is we live in a community of intellectual property. If you look at the number of patents that come out of Israel every year, the number of publications that come out of Israel every year, we have a lot to be proud of because we are completely disproportionate in terms of our amounts than any other country or nation in the world. Far more patents come out of Israel per capita than any other country in the world. And that also means that we have a very, very rich reservoir of fabulous brains in this country. And uh, it you don't have to go very far to get assistance. And don't be afraid to ask people to assist you. We have a lot of advisors. We pay. Some of them are like me. They don't care. It's money is not the issue with them. Uh, saving lives is the issue. We're very compassionate people. We find ourselves highly motivated, not just because of what we do, but because of the people around us and the ability of the people around us to contribute actively to what we do. I would have to look very far in the United States to find all of these people in such close proximity. You just wouldn't be able to do it. If you're going to develop, this is the place to do it. You know, when, uh, when I read Startup Nation, Americans were shocked when they read the book. But anybody who lives in this country in the IP world, no, it was no surprise. You have an idea, go out and patent it and start making it. It's, it's, it's who we are. Interestingly, you're not 
focused necessarily on the Israeli market. You're more focused on other markets. Can you talk a little bit about that? We would like to sell in Israel, but uh, I have to tell you one thing about the medical industry for anybody out there, any entrepreneur that does anything that's going to be related to anything medical. The joke I always make about the medical industry is that it's so conservative that it'll conserve itself to death. And this is the rule. Everybody wants to be first to be second. That's how it works, okay? Because when you have, uh, when you talk to institutions, people generally are afraid to take chances. It's more so in this country because it's, even though we go to the crap table all the time on our ideas, but as a society, we're actually fairly conservative. So uh, it's more likely that I'll find somebody in America who will say, wow, this is going to help me save money and they'll jump into it. Whereas we have a socialist system here in medicine where there isn't really that much of a financial incentive. And so people can afford to be more conservative here. In that sense, we'd like to sell the, the Israeli you know, market, but we, we just really don't because of the fact it's so conservative. One thing we didn't talk about too much is raising money. What sort of tips do you have for startups who are interested in raising money to get their products out there, to get their ideas developed? Well, the first thing you've got to do is this. We've always looked at who the investors were. Now, many of you guys out there who are starting out don't have that luxury. As much as possible, we always look for somebody who brings something to the table other than just money. And that's the key. Uh, yes, the world is in a downspin, and yes, the world economy is down, but I've got to let everybody know there's a lot of money out there chasing not as many deals as there used to be. If you've got a really good idea, the first thing you've got to have is a really good business plan, and it's got to be your first investment. You've got to have a very, very clear, very focused business plan that will show what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and once you've got the product, who are you going to take it to, all right? And so that's your first key. You've got to have a good business plan and you've got to have proof of concept. You've got to come to an investor who's going to look at what you're going to do and his question is, all right, uh, I'll take a gamble on you, but I want it to be a calculated gamble. And so you've got to reduce as many possible questions as possible from that investor's mind when you sit opposite him. Don't hold back on these things. And by the way, don't go wild with hype. Sophisticated investors will see right through it, and then it works against you. So you want to describe your product or your idea as accurately as possible. Absolutely. What you expect it to do, how you expect it to do it, what your steps are going to be. If you lay out a roadmap that is a logical roadmap and shows that leaving aside unforeseen factors, you know, we all know what we know. What we, what we don't know is what scares us. But as much as possible, lay out the outline as clearly as you possibly can. And where there are risks, you should be the one to come forward and say, this is the risk. Because the investor will be investing not just in your concept, he'll be investing in you as the entrepreneur. And that probably is more important than your concept. You could have the greatest idea in the world, but if you come off like you're selling snake oil, nobody's going to touch you. Those are important tips. Thanks. In terms of inventors and coming up with new ideas, new marketing ideas or new inventions, what processes do you have in place within the company to promote that? That's actually very nice. It's a good question. What has happened is everybody said, you know, Argamon is Jeff. And what I've been doing these past six months to a year is de-Jeffing the company. I don't want the company to be dependent on me. The company has to have its own personality and its own momentum. And that means bringing on the right people to assist you in getting your job done. More often than not, entrepreneurs are good at ideas. They may even be good at selling it initially, but you've got to seek people with experience who can push the products correctly. And there are a lot of people out there with a lot of experience. Find them because they will actually do tremendous amount of shortcutting for you because they've been around the block. You haven't. By the way, I want to mention we have a tremendous reservoir of very, very talented people in this country. Thanks a lot, Jeff, for participating in this podcast interview. I learned a lot and I wish you and Argaman lots of success. 
Thank you, and uh, I wish success to everybody listening to this podcast. And if there's any way I can help anybody, I'm I'm always happy to to, to assist. And thank you for the opportunity of of this podcast. Thanks a lot, Jeff. That was Jeff Gabe, the chief scientist, president, and founder of Argamon Technologies in Jerusalem, Israel. We hope you enjoyed this episode. There are many more to come. We'd love to hear about your startup and what you're working on. If you have a great innovation, we'd love to hear from you. Please contact us by going to jmbdavis, D-A-V-I-S dot com forward slash startup. We have a special site specifically made for startups in order to help startups protect their innovations. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to being with you in the next episode.